Ooh, we are live. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to So and Terra live chat. We do this every Monday night at 6 p.m. Pacific time. And tonight we have a special guest. Um, so first of all, I know usually we go through the comments and I'll, I'll we'll do some of that. But uh, I want to maybe do some welcoming hellos and highs yeah. and uh, we'll, we'll get started here. And we have Aaron from Guido's Family Farm, and he's here to talk about bees. So get your bee questions ready and um, keep your questions and comments family friendly. Aaron, how about you do a, 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 uh, a welcoming thing? How are you? And tell us a little bit about you and your farm. So I'm Aaron, um, Christina and Lane and myself have Ghidro's family farm. We have mostly quail, bees, turkeys, chickens, goats, pigs. Um, we like to garden. We like to preserve our own food and really enjoy sharing our experiences with the community. And you also have a YouTube channel. Christina oh, has a YouTube channel. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll be honest and say we've been, we've been lacking on the uh, posting videos, <laughs> but it's, like a busy time for us and then we had uh it's funny i'm here on, on here talking about bees we had a bee incident last week christina got stung on the face and her eyes swole shut for a few days so is she better I, now yeah she's better now she's back to being just mean to me because I'm, I, a good reason now yeah <laughs> christina you have a reason now <laughs> between my bees and my goats i don't think she's happy with me right now uh oh, uh oh. Hopefully, there's still a garden left, Christina. <laughs> yeah. Thankfully, the garden's protected. We have, we have plants in the animal yard that the goats ate today. Oh. Well, <laughs> that the goats ate today. That means it's not there anymore. <laughs> the the stalk's still there, so I'm hoping it'll grow back. All right. All right. <clears throat> well, Verna put uh, you guys' channel link in the comments. Thank you, Verna. Verna is Vay's place. She's in blue with a little wrench. Check out her channel if you're interested in growing things on the small scale. She grows an apartment. And there's a whole bunch of people here today. I'm going to just kind of say hello to everyone real quick, and then we'll get into some questions. Um, and we'll go from there. Does that work for you? Yes. All right. Christina's on here. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Welcome, Christina. Glad you're feeling better. And Dawn's here. Hi, Dawn. And everybody's saying hi. Erica's here. Hi, Erica. I got your email. Thank you. Rock Hill Homestead's here. Welcome, welcome. All right. Vern is here. Thank you for coming and moderating and welcome. All right. Everybody, I'm just scanning through. Oh. Verna says, Aaron, that rabbit was very tasty. And I was right. Cooey does taste like rabbit. You got it. You got yeah. it. Awesome. I processed rabbits yesterday. So we have no more in the grow out. More that need to go in the grow out soon. All right. Let's see. Who else is on here? Joy's here. Hello from Western Oregon. Hello, Joy. Welcome. All right. Buster's here. Hi, Buster. Serena's hey, here. Welcome, Serena. I don't think I've seen you on the channel before, so welcome, and I hope you're having a good day. We're talking about bees today, but uh, normally we talk about all things homestead related. So, <laughs> all right. If I missed you, I'm sorry. Hello to everyone. And so, Aaron, let's get into this bee thing. So, how long have you been raising bees for? Um, I've been actually having bees for a little over a year. Um, I was kind of, I was scared of bees. So I researched bees for around 10 years. Christine and I really wanted bees. And I want bees too. I'm too close to a school though. You have an alternative. I at, have an alternative. <laughs> look, look at the mason bees. You get the same pollinating effects. Oh, no, do. I get lots of bees. I have lots oh. and lots of native bees oh. in my yard, but I can't have honeybees. It's against the ordinances. Oh, that's not fun. 
I know, I know. <laughs> Not every place has these ordinances, and they're silly because you see honeybees at the school. They go there. Yeah. So how, I'm asking this ahead of time, but this makes sense to add in here. How long, how far do honeybees travel? They'll travel normally around three miles is their normal range. And then if they're really struggling to find nectar, they'll go up to five miles from the wow. hive. That's a lot of flapping. It's probably why they have an extra set of wings. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, how did you get into, so you've, you've been researching for a very long time. So when you finally decided, yes, I'm going to do it, was it easier or harder than what you expected? And what kind of bring us along on your bee story? So it was absolutely easier than I thought. I thought bees would be a lot of work. I thought we'd have to be involved in them every day. And it's really not. It's probably the easiest thing we have around here. Um, I jumped into it and, and ended up with two hives and they were newly established splits. So I had to feed them. It was like every five days add a gallon of sugar water. So actual time involved the first three months was maybe an hour total for two hives. Wow. That's pretty good. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I think it was like four months after we got our first two hives that we were harvesting honey that fast yes so they they put out honey quickly yeah and it has more to do with our climate and where we at and the amount of nectar they could bring in everything's flowering there all the time <laughs> yeah pretty much you know except for like two weeks out of the year everything's flowering right right so did you how did once you decided to get started, what did you do? Is there a local bee group that you went to? Was there a mentor that you have or had or how did how did that work? So I got my bees originally from a guy, I guess you could call him my mentor. He kind of helped me out. He didn't really do much hands-on helping, but he was answering my calls and my text messages and kind of guide me through. And I I think it was different because when I originally reached out to him, he started asking questions and I was answering the questions properly. So, you know, he, he, he thought I raised, yet. yeah, he thought I raised bees before. So it was a pretty smooth transition. And I mean, when I went actually pick up the bees from his house, I spent about 30 minutes with them and then I left with the bees and set them up. Right. I'm I, my I feel like people. that's how it was for with quail for me that I researched, researched, researched because that's just my personality. It wasn't for ten years, but I you know I researched, researched, and then when I finally started raising them and you know incubation and all that, like it, it, I had so much research in my head that it was very easy. So that's good to know that that's true with bees. <laughs> yeah, I I, ju I jumped into it. Because I was, I had bees for about three months, and I was removing bee swarms. Which it is, was that quick when you were removing. I knew it was yeah. quick. I didn't know it was that quick. Yeah, it was. It was quick. Okay, so when you are, so what hives do you have, and why did you decide on those hives? And then through your bee removal, because you've done several of them now what types of like structures and trees and stuff have you seen them in? Um, I know I've seen swarms when they, they swarm and, and go on different places. Um, and sometimes there's some trees that I've seen, you know, they're flying in and out of, but yeah, just kind of like, what are the housing situations? So I use the Langstroth hive and that's the typical hives you'll see like in commercial applications, the one that they, they stack on top of each other. Um, there's a few different um, types of hives, and then there's like the one that's really commercialized, the flow hive. I'm not a fan. I think it's more of a decoration. <laughs> you know, do, you, do you not think it's functional, or do you don't, or do you not think it's best for the bees? I don't think it's best for the bees, in my personal opinion. I'll I'll never own one. Okay, and that's because. I don't, I just, so you leave a lot behind the way the, the frames separate and the honey mm -hmm. comes out. So you leave a lot of the extra value of raising bees, the 
the wax. So then there goes your beeswax candles and your beeswax salves and stuff like that. You don't have access to that. And it's just, it's not functional for me. And I just, I think you leave a lot of honey behind and it's just a waste. And for one flow hive, I could buy five Langstroth hives. Right. And those are stackable quite high, right? I, I I pushed the limit last year in the middle of the honey flow, and I let it get like six honey supers high. Then I couldn't get into it anymore, so I had to hurry up and harvest honey in the middle of the honey flow because I couldn't add another box. I had one hive that was a super producer, so okay. this, this hive, I, at least once a week, I was adding another super to the top of it. Wow, that's a lot. That's a lot. And so have you seen the ones that go sideways? They just, it's just like elongated. I'm guessing that that's less efficient space wise. I um, look at those and really ones. I have a local guy here that he actually builds my beehives for me now. He's an older retired guy and he just he builds beehives for me. And I want to I want him to build one. I'm looking for drawings. I would like to try one. Right. OK. Yeah, I just recently saw that and I kind of equated it in my head to the horror. It's not even close, but to the horizontal um, worm bins where you yeah. start with one side and then you go to the other side. And it seems like this one, I mean, it's up to them where they harvest but or, or where they uh, make the honey, but where maybe you block off part of it and do this side and then open up that side. I don't know how they work. Yeah, and like I, I like to research different things and like so some of the colder climates in other countries, they'll actually build a, a barn and have the hives inside of the barn and have the entrance and exit on the outside. That way they can control the climate and overwinter them better. I've seen that in a in a living history museum before. Yeah. That was mostly for demonstration purposes, but it was really cool because they had it in like a plexiglass so you could see it inside. It's really cool. So yeah. Um, hi, PJ. Hi, everyone. If you guys have questions for Aaron about bees, put them in the in the chat and I'll incorporate it into our discussion here. Um, and then you said that you've done a bee. What are they called bee rescues? I don't know what they're called. So um, bee locations. <laughs> so I've gotten a lot of calls for just your typical swarm, a bunch of bees in a tree that mm -hmm. You know, they swarm. They swarmed out of their home, whether it was a a beehive or you know just a wild bee colony. Those are the easy ones. I had that and, happen twice in a week in in uh, my tree, my yeah. peach tree. I had a, a neighbor's brother came over in his, you know, suit, and I took a. <laughs> you guys are gonna laugh at this. I don't have a bee suit because I don't have bees. <laughs> So, but I do have a delicates bag from the from the uh, you know washing machine, so I put on a hat with a brim. And I put a delicates bag over my head, <laughs> put long sleeves on and gloves, and I was out there with them. It worked. They didn't go in it. They landed on it. <laughs> yeah, whatever yeah. works. <laughs> yeah. And then, um, so in 21, 2021, our area had got hit by a major hurricane. So we had a bunch of houses that were left abandoned that were, you know, ready to be demolitions. Last year, they really started demoing houses a lot. And I got several calls to go remove bees out of houses. So they're just now demoing the houses now from 2021. Yeah. There's a lot of things living in those walls then. Yeah, there's some snakes and other critters, <laughs> rats, possums, raccoons. Oh, wow. Wow. So buildings and trees and and swarms, huh? Yeah, it's swarms are are the easiest. I did a swarm okay. week before last inside of a camper. <laughs> and I had 20 minutes. I was in and out. I saw one once on a car and they weren't going anywhere. <laughs> it was like <laughs> in a crease on a door of a car <laughs> it's like yeah you're not going anywhere for a while just wait wait a few hours it's kind of funny sometimes they go pretty quickly 
because the queen is heavy she doesn't fly very far but sometimes they they'll stay in an area for a short amount of time and sometimes they'll stay in it for half a day when they're moving do you know what affects that just so they are <laughs> when when they leave when they swarm they take as much honey as they can for food so they're conserving resources and resting okay. okay and a lot of times not every time but a lot a lot of the time you'll see them in some kind of fruit tree is where they'll rest my peach tree yeah a lot of citrus trees and that's where they choose to rest and sometimes it's like you said a few hours sometimes it's overnight that they'll rest a, yeah, lot, a lot of times yeah, go ahead. I've seen them out in the high desert as well. And they just choose a shrub, and there doesn't look like there's much to hold on to. But there are just all these big, not as big as the ones I've seen here. There's, I think there's probably smaller hives, but um, you know, a clump of bees this big on a shrub that's pretty good. Yeah, you you seen the video of the hot the swarm I caught um, in the tree next door. Mm -hmm. That that was a huge swarm. That was that was a huge swarm like i was standing on top of a ladder and it i i had a cardboard box because that was the only thing i could lift to get up there and i had to get like three or four times of getting bees and carrying them down wow how many bees in a pound i'm not sure i never weighed them oh i know that wasn't on our free plan question i just no. was curious hi now john you came in down. we're talking yeah, how many bees in a pound? That would be, you know, how they sell like bait, uh, bait worms. Mm -hmm. They you know, sell them by a pound. Like, well, how many are in there? <laughs> I could tell you, an empty box with just bees before they put honey in it is extremely heavy. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. I bet. Now, when they move the honey, I guess they ingest it and then, yeah, uningest it. <laughs> yeah. So. If you really like honey and you have a weak stomach, mute mute the, the speaker. So the honey making process, foragers collect the honey and they bring it back to the hive and they give it to the worker bees. The worker bees take the honey in, regurgitate it and pass it on to other worker bees all the way to the comb. So there's a lot of eating and regurgitating. Okay. And then how does it actually become honey? It's just through that it, process? So it still has a lot of moisture in that process, but as they regurgitating it, they're drying it and then they put it in a comb and they won't cap it until it's dry until it has a low enough moisture content where it won't ferment. Okay. They, bees are actually super intelligent. Um what they'll do is they'll fan their wings over the comb to dry the nectar to an acceptable sense. moisture content. That makes sense. Um, Verna has a question. Is it true that a swarm is the queen's maiden flight? Not every time. Usually what will happen is... Oh, my dog. Um, you, usually what will happen is a new queen emerges. And because typically the, the worker bees are unhappy with the original queen. So they'll make a takeover. <laughs> yeah, they'll make a queen cell. She'll hatch out. She'll go on a mating flight and she'll mate as many drones as she can. It's a whole bunch. She comes back and then typically they'll throw the original queen out and she'll take bees with her. Okay. So it's splitting the hive. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Lady Marianne. Um, so here's another question from John. I got tore up with Africanized bees. Those buggers were aggressive. How do you know? I know Africanized honeybee. Acri There's Africanized African bees, which I don't know what they're called really, but they're they're very aggressive, but their sting is not very strong. And here, their sting is the honeybees, which is the European honeybee. Their their sting is much stronger, and they're more docile. How do you know, um, when do you know, if you know, if a hive has been um, Africanized, for lack of a better word? Is there a word that's more correct? Hi, Kelly. So, 
So the Africanized bees are not really very common in the United States. Mm-hmm. There, you do have aggressive honeybees. Um, I'm actually dealing with a uh, aggressive hive right now. I need to requeen the hive. So, because I, I think that's where Christina got stung. <laughs> I don't want to tell her, but I think that's the hive. Well, I think she's on here. I think she knows now. <laughs> she's sitting around right inside of me with the dogs. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily an Africanized bee, which that. From everything I've researched, the Africanized bees tend to be slightly smaller in physical size. And you could still technically take an Africanized colony and requeen it and make it more docile. So if you have just a regular non-Africanized, but if you have a, a nasty... A nasty hive and you requeen, what is your expectation of when they might chill out? So with the life sp- lifespan of bees, um, once you requeen, she goes on her mating flight or you could buy mating mated queens online. You're looking at about six weeks and the hive should start calming down because all of her genetics will be moved out and it'll be all the new queen's genetics. Mostly. It, it'll start tapering off around six weeks, the aggression. Do we know where that aggression is? Like, is it... It, se- it, it seems like, just from listening to your answer, that it's somewhere in the genetic code. Yeah. Is there something else that is coded with that, do you know? No. It As, as far as I know, it's just the genetics from the queen. And okay. once you get rid of her then you'll be fine. But you don't want to get, you don't want to necessarily replace her with a queen cell out of her hive. You want to do it from a different hive. Okay. Okay. Serena's been throwing the jokes. I'm enjoying them, Serena. But I'll read this one. What intelligent insect is found in classrooms? Spelling bee. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good All one. Right. So um, you know that bees are the only insects that provide us food? I don't know. I mean, people eat insects, crickets. Well, I've had grasshoppers. They don't provide us food. We just eat them. They right. Okay. Okay. So they're making the food. They yeah. aren't the food. Are is that true? Yeah. The only insect that makes food. Yep. I guess we I mean, don't eat the mushrooms that ants grow, do we? Yet. <laughs> yet. That's very cool. I didn't think of that at all. Jay's here. Welcome. All right. Chocolate cover bugs. Yeah, but they don't chocolate cover themselves, John. <laughs> that is a that is a nice fact. That's a nice fact. Um <clears throat> okay, your son is highly involved in the in the B uh is apiary, I guess. In yeah. apiary. Uh how did that come about? Was he just excited to dive in and you're like, "Hey, put on a suit?" Or how did that come about? I know he's he's definitely a very active kid in all things farm lifestyle. <laughs> so yeah, Lane Lane is very involved in everything I do, and I absolutely love it. If it wouldn't be for him being involved in it, I probably would have just two hives. <laughs> how many do you have? Um, a lot. Uh, a lot. yeah. <laughs> we don't know. Is that the answer? We don't count. So when I got my original hives in, I ordered just the boxes um, online. I had to assemble it. Lane and I assembled it, and he started asking questions. So Christina saw the road we're heading down, so she ordered a bee suit for him. Good and, idea, Christina. Save your order your own yeah. one. On, order your own self one. <laughs> and so I mean, he's just he just jumped into it, and I thought the first time he would get stung, he would you know, be scared of it. And he got stung on one removal. It was in a two story house and it was in the floor upstairs. So we locked ourselves in the bedroom and we were kneeling down. So he ended up getting stung and he went, walked back to the truck. I thought for sure when I would be done, he would be in the truck crying or, you know, whatever a seven year old kid does at the time of getting stung by a bee. I turned around. He was back in the room with me. Oh boy. 
so that that comes to the next question. Um, do you carry? Do you recommend having an EpiPen if you have an apiary? And I don't know if you can answer this question for everybody, but does health insurance generally cover that, or is that something special that you have to get as a business kind of expense? Or like, how do you know how that works? So that would actually be prescription based. So you'd have to visit a doctor and determine your allergies on it um, to to actually get it and Sadly, even with medical insurance, the EpiPens are really expensive. Okay. I was thinking that maybe like, hey, I'm being responsible. I have a bunch of bees. Someone might come over and get stung. I should have EpiPen, but they don't see it that way, huh? No. It, I don't know why. Because it's not like you could do anything like... It's not a drug. Right, right. It's something we already have and can make ourselves, but not that quickly. <laughs> yeah. That amount. All right. We have a comment here. Rock Hill Homestead says, this is an important lesson that I learned last year with my own bees that I got from Aaron. When setting up your hives, there are a few essentials. A beetle trap is one of those things. So let's talk about a little bit about um, pests. And also I'm going to say hello to, I thought someone new came in. I don't know who oh came in, but hello. I don't remember who it was. So are there there pests and um and all that? So hang on. So there's beetles, you get hive beetles, and it you you would probably have the same issue in your climate um as we have down here that the beetles they just thrive in the ground. Yeah. And they they lay their eggs, and we use screen bottom boards so the eggs just fall down to the ground. You know, beetle emerges, comes back into the hive, and then there's varroa mites. Varroa mites is probably the biggest killer of bees or collapses of colonies. Um, and I've I've heard um, of using powdered sugar to control for mites, with the thought being that you put a little powdered sugar over the ladies, and they clean each other. Is that Something you've heard of, something that's good or bad. Yeah. So what they do, you're gonna sprinkle you sprinkle powder sugar on top of the hive and they eat the sugar off of off of each other. And they're not eating the mites, but by them eating the sugar, they're knocking the mites mites off. They fall through the bottom. And the only I don't really treat for mites. I have beetle traps. Beetles scare me more than mites. Okay. And that might be a regional thing. I just I've just heard of that and haven't really. I mean, yeah. I don't have I have no experience, so <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the the beetles scare me more because we don't really have a ground frost here, so right. it won't kill any larvae in the ground under the hives. We don't really have like a hard hard like we rarely get a, a hard frost, and it doesn't really go into the ground really. So what do the beetles do? The beetles will tunnel inside the honeycomb and they'll eat all of the larvae and the honey behind the capping. So you won't know, but you'll grab a frame and the frame will be, it'll look full and it'll be empty behind it. Oh, okay. Which in turn ends up, if they, once they get into the brood colony section of it, they'll end up wiping it out faster than they could reproduce. That makes sense. John, he does not have a flow hive. Um, let me see if there's any other questions here. Uh, John says, when the wild bees stung the heck out of me, my allergies to dust and pollen calmed down for a little while. I know a lot of people, I don't know a lot of people, I know people have talked about um, bee venom being something they use medicinally. I'm not going to recommend that because I know nothing about that, but um, oftentimes there is, um, medicine studies the poisonous things and I'm sure it's used somehow. I don't know if you know anything. To I don't know any that. medicinal stuff on yeah. the bee stings, but it, it could be with the bee with the bee venom being in you that I could see where your body is going to fight it and would help you with allergies. I don't recommend getting stung by bees for fun. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> or for not fun, for no, for any reason. 
Yeah. Not All in right. the face. Jay, Jay has a, a statement. Honeypot ants are another group of insects that produce food that humans eat. Not the insect, but the sweet secretions. In Australia, people eat the, the secretes and insects at the same time. So they have like a honeydew. Oh. There we go. There we now, go. Now have some midnight and, reading. Uh, yeah, you, you read up on everything? Mm-hmm. All right, Jennifer's here. Hi, I'm just gonna go through here. Green stock with strawberries, that's awesome. All right, John's here. Are chickens, miss, and bee mites, oh, mites, chicken mites and bee mites? Mites are species specific is my understanding. Yeah. Is that your understanding too? Yes. Okay. Um, I got into, were they mites? I got into bird mites at work one time and it was very nasty. I reached into an, there, an old nest. There wasn't anything in it to take it down. I'm a wildlife biologist. And as I reached in, I saw it was like a movie. The mites just covered my hands and down my arm. And the thing is, I couldn't feel it. They were so small. It was so nasty. Anyway, but they didn't bite me. I was not a bird. I'm still not a bird. All right, Don says, do you have to worry about when communities send the mosquito trucks out spraying at night? Yes, it terrifies me. You know, in any any kind of spraying um, terrifies me. Luckily, my beehives are far enough away from the road that I don't really notice a loss. I'm sure I do lose bees that are out foraging the next day and get mixed up with it. Right. But I have heard of people with this, the mosquito truck passing in the street and cause them issues with their hives. Cause it's yeah, essentially it's, it's, so. fo it's fogging. It's a heavy fog. So if you, your hive is close to the fallout, then it, it won't be good. And the wind direction and all that too. Yeah. Right. But then yeah. luckily we live in a community where they don't spray very often. Good. Good. Hi, Bob. Um, that's, that's good. Um, so I'm just looking through some of these questions that I wrote down. Um, besides the goat travesty, <laughs> have you noticed any difference in fruit production in the garden since having bees? Has the, has that increased the productivity of your, of your garden? So, for as many hives as I have, the bees don't forage in my garden as much as I thought they would. So they like another I, way. <laughs> I have my hives facing the garden. The the bees come out of the hive and go back over the top. Do yeah, you still they, have native bees in your yard? Yes. <laughs> yes, I'll have like the, the red wasp and then the you know the bumblebees and everybody. You won't look at a flower and they'll have multiple different species of bees on, on the same flower. Right. The only thing I know in my really... yard, I've, I've uh, strived to have flowers at, at every point or almost every point of the year, which I can have. I'm in the same zone as, as Aaron. We're both 9B, um, but I get colder, I think. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> that I see so many different types of native bees and honey the honeybees are strong in my yard right now borage is man the number one flower for that right now uh, <clears throat> but i see a lot of that i have not observed in my yard any um any altercations between honeybees and native bees have you experienced any of that or do you know if that happens no, I have not seen any altercations between different bee species. I know, I think they live along the lines of everybody hates hornets. So as long as you're not a hornet, they live in harmony. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Um, <clears throat> I know I read a paper a, a long time ago about... Um, the study that was done in Maine at a blueberry uh, farm and people literally staked out flowers until it was pollinated by a bee 
wrote down what the species was, bagged it until it became a berry, and then they planted those seeds <laughs> to see how viable those seeds were. And in that specific study in Maine, which may or may not apply to anywhere other than Maine, uh, they found that native bees were um, had produced fruit. Native bees pollinated flowers, which produced fruit that had more viable seeds in them. They also were out during rain and were out earlier and later in the day because likely because they don't store a whole lot of food like honeybees mm -hmm. do. So <clears throat> when do honeybees move? Are they, are they actually limited by temperature with their bodies or like I tend to see them on sunny days? So typically below 60 degrees, you won't see much activity. Like I personally, I will not open up my hives below 60 degrees, but above 60 and the sun shining, it, it looks like a major highway with bees flying in and out coming in right now. They're coming in with pollen pants. They look so cute. <laughs> pollen on their called. back legs. Yeah, pollen pants. It looks like I little picture, pants. I picture the cargo pants, you know, like stuffed full. That's, that's what it looks like. <laughs> yeah. So here's another um, thing. Um, honeybees are not native to North America. Yep. Yeah. European, right? Yep, European. Well before us, but European. Hello to Ken and Brad. We haven't seen you in a while, Brad. Yeah, Brad, I haven't seen you in a while. He's going to come to CoCon, says. Yeah. Awesome. Brad, well, he Brad. says you're driving, so. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully you know this now. <laughs> Brad was here yesterday picking up quail and quail eggs. Oh. And Ken says hitting 80 degrees days now. Today was 60 something. I'm going to kind of scroll through this, see if we have any questions. Um, man, 80s in Oklahoma. Over 50 degrees is when Verna sees bees. Yeah. Bees with quirky butts. <laughs> I like that, Jay. Okay. Yeah, Great Horn Owls, it's starting breeding season for, well, they've been actually in their season for a while. All right. And Brad's building, building quail stuff. Awesome. So, again, we're talking bees tonight. So, if you have questions about bees or other things, but bees, um, let us know. Verna says, Aaron, what is the hardest part of keeping bees in your opinion? The hardest part about keeping bees would probably be harvesting honey for me. What? Harvesting honey. Because every, everything's heavy. Did you start out with like hand tools and then got a spinner or what is your pro what was your personal process with that? Cause I feel like I see a lot of people starting out with bees and they're like, we're going to do this the minimalist way. And then they're like, Oh, I got to get something. <laughs> so our first honey harvest, which was only maybe one super that we did manually and we strained the honey out and it was very time consuming. So we got a manual honey spinner, which the mentor and everyone else I talked to, and then I watch David Burns on YouTube a lot, said it's not worth it getting the um, electric honey spinner or like the 16 frame honey spinner if mm -hmm. you're not going to have 30 to 40 hives. Like it's financially, it's not worth it. So we got a four frame honey spinner and manual, and we could turn some honey out pretty quick. Okay. Can you attach it to a drill? <laughs> it's that thing's geared pretty well. So like you're not spinning the handle fast and it's spinning honey. Okay. That's good then. That's good. Um, <clears throat> Steve has, Hey Steve, welcome. He, uh, Steve has a question. If you turn your hive towards the fence, would they go to your yard or flowers? Not just tasty. I have an experience where, I had a job site and then I'll have you answer. I had a job site. It was next to a cemetery 
and they dumped all the dirt up up by the top of the hill and next to that was next to that, those piles of dirt there was hundreds of bee boxes somebody had figured out in the middle of san jose hey i can rent this land i can own this land i don't know if they, i don't know what the situation was but they had tons of bee boxes up there and the bees all of them would go down the hill to one side you know, or at the top of the hill and they would oh they would always go there like i would survey on the hill and i would have my clipboard held right here so they didn't get in my ear <laughs> they were go they were just bouncing off things um, every morning. And so my understanding, and you can correct me, is that when they find a source, they, they, everybody goes to that source and then they find another source and they, everybody goes to that source. Is that how you've seen them work? That That's pretty much how it's done. They'll mostly stick together. And so like where the bees are flying behind over the hive, it's just open fields and a ton of mulberry trees. Oh, so they have everything they need. But like my neighbors, they have a small garden and I was at their house yesterday or the day before and they have a bunch of green onions and it was full of bees and the flowers on the green onions. Okay. Yeah, I've seen that. <laughs> yeah. They they love it. And then they started we we still have clovers here. Nice. The the white clover. So they cut their grass, but they cut it a little high to keep the clovers for the bees to forage. Right. Yeah. I mean, yep. that makes sense. Um, I know a biologist who's changed his front lawn to uh, violas because there was an endangered uh, butterfly that used it as a host plant. So his whole lawn was endangered butterfly habitat and they would come. It's pretty cool. That's you can amazing. change your ways, right? Yeah. All right. So Ken is asking, are there local regulations on keeping bees on private property? Yes, there are in some places where I am. I it, the ordinances for the town I live in. I'm too close to school, even though bees are seen in a school, and even though, as Aaron said earlier in the talk, bees can go between three and five miles to forage. Um, yeah, that doesn't make any sense. Um, I don't know. If, I think most of them are local ordinances. I don't think there's like a big ordinance or big. Is there a law a law keeping for apiary people? Not really in my local area. They have they have several beekeepers um, around here, and there's not really any issues with it. No one goes and put bees like a beehive on a property line facing their neighbors. It's right kind of like more of a courtesy thing. And I see we have a question about my neighbors complaining. Um, no, Go my neighbor, my neighbors love honey and yep. they, they love the fact that we we're beekeeping. We give them a bunch of things that we make with the honey and the bees. And, uh, like we did ferment honey, fermented garlic last year and supplied them with that. So all my neighbors, they love the animals. Nobody complains about the roosters. They get right. eggs. Yeah, free food. That's how you win people over free food. Yeah. <laughs> food food is definitely the way to anybody's heart it's it's on the way <laughs> yeah yeah uh jay is asking what are some of the ways a non-beekeeper can help with native bee populations pollinator gardens pollinator house avoiding chemicals in the garden etc yeah yeah plant those flowers yeah every flower you can sunflowers are really good christina loves to grow sunflowers and the bees love sunflowers. And Christina has a ton of flowers, but the bees love it. That's good. So, so flowers and probably don't spray pesticides, right? Yeah. Or other sprays. Yeah. I know I didn't do it this year, but when I play, when I spray copper, I spray it in the evening after the bees have gone to bed. Um, I think there's probably several, if you're spraying anything, there's several things that are likely going to be, like that where once it's dry it's not really as harmful um i also spray it you know when the flowers on the tree are not there yet <laughs> yeah so yeah. we don't use any pesticides on the farm so yeah. we're not concerned about the bees foraging in our garden we can't control what happens to five year five mile radius <laughs> yeah like all of our immediate neighbors do not use it for the for the reason for the bees 
Right. Okay. Like we were getting our yard sprayed for mosquitoes before I got the bees. Oh wow. And and we we've stopped since we got the bees. And have you seen any mosquito uptick because of that? It it comes and goes. Like right now is probably one of the worst times of the year for mosquitoes here. Because we're getting so much rain and it's not quite hot enough. Then it'll get to a point this summer that it'll be too hot. You won't even see mosquitoes. Right. We don't have them very often here. I've seen some this year. Last year I saw some. Last year I think they even sprayed somewhere north of town at night because they had, um, I think it was West Nile. I think there was like a, a portion where they found a lot of West Nile. And so they took out that population. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's typically the only way we see, we see like mosquito spraying here is if they have West Nile, a West Nile outbreak, then they'll go around and start spraying. Right. Ken is asking any ordinances about selling bee products. That's likely not going to be an ordinance that's likely going to be under your cottage food laws but i will yeah. let you answer that so we don't we don't really sell honey or bee products we're more givers you know we like we like to share things and we really enjoy for holidays instead of buying family presents from a store we make gift baskets of homemade products Right. You know, the honey and the different the different things, the eggs and preserved vegetables and jellies and jams and, you know, everything we make here, we give it as gifts. Right. And that's going to vary based on your state, based on your county, yeah. all of that. So, like, for California, I have not looked it up. However, I would assume it goes under the cottage foods. Yeah. And for, I did look I did look into it and like. I won't offer honey on my website just because of shipping's expensive because, because of the it's heavy. <laughs> um, but the laws are very loose on honey since it is preserved already. You know, it's no, right. it's not processed. It's not so bad. Yeah, like I could ship you a frame of honey, and then you can harvest it yourself. You know, I could leave a frame of honey sitting out on the counter, capped, and nothing's ever going to yeah. happen to it. Well, beeswax also lasts forever. That's what toilet rings are made out of. Um, yeah. And that's because they're pliable still when they get really old. Yeah. We, we Random have, toilet fact. <laughs> yeah. We have tons of beeswax hanging around here in in sheets. Christina, Christina will harvest it and she'll boil it to get to separate the wax from any uh, particle, other particles that's in there. And then she'll just break it out the sheet and just she stores it like that. She makes cool. bee, beeswax and plantain salve for bee stings and insect bites. Got that all over, huh? Yeah, she, <laughs> she did rub it on her. <laughs> oh, boy. All right. Uh, Steve has another good question. I noticed that many new beekeepers fail. What is a common reason for failure by a new beekeeper? Um, Quite lack of knowledge on hive inspections. Um, a lot of new beekeepers will, when doing hive inspections, which you could just do a simple Google search and you could find a hive inspection checklist. Oh, nice. Um, I kind of loosely follow that. I'll be honest. One of the main things that will ruin a new beekeeper is insisting on finding the queen every time you do a hive inspection. And if everybody what, else is there, she's there, right? <laughs> so what happens is they typically, they'll smash the queen because she's bigger, she's slower, and she's she's really not concerned. Like any other bee, the worker bees, they'll fly away, they'll move away from you, but the queen, she'll just, that's, that's her hive, that she's the queen. She's not concerned about you, and she'll get smashed, and then you end up with a colony loss because there's no queen. Right. Like when I when I go down into the brood bro box doing inspections, which I'm I'm not really con that concerned with doing it. I just look for signs of a queen. I look for fresh eggs. I, you know, right. I look for cat brood. I, just signs of her being there, and 
then you know the hive's healthy. So ignorance and over exuberance. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, Ken would like to know how do you keep bees out of your hummingbird feeders? Um, I don't think you can. So I'd recommend if you do have bees and you do have a hummingbird feeder, don't put any dye in it because you're going to have red honey. Yeah. Well, and also it's bad for the hummingbirds anyway. Yeah. Um, hi, Andy Rabbit. I have a funny story. It's not really that funny. It was just funny at the time. Um, I love going to, and I haven't been for years, uh, Joshua Tree National Park Park Monument. I don't remember what it is now. Um, it's desert. It's, you know, there's no water. You got to pack in all your water, all that. And I, um, time before last, I think I went backpacking, had a, you know, backpacked out, did a camp, a base camp that I did trails from. And, uh, you know, you're out hiking and your feet sweat. So you stop every once in a while, take your, take your feet out of your boots, let them air out. There you go. And a bee. And they warn you about this. They warn you about leaving your water open because the bees will smell it or sense it, however they do, mm -hmm. and they will come to it. Uh, and I had a bee show up and it, it landed on my sock and it put its tongue in to get the moisture. And I felt this little bee tongue <laughs> on my ankle and it was pretty fun. I mean, it, it would have been different probably if there was tons of bees, but it was just one little honeybee that showed up and uh, was getting some moisture and some electrolytes. It's pretty, pretty funny. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. B bees are uh, interesting. Yes. Yes. So um, they have a very interesting society. Do you want to go over kind of what their society is and how they communicate? Um, so they are super intelligent. I'm, I'm convinced that we don't have aliens. It's just bees. They, they are super intelligent. They communicate through their vibrations and senses they could smell. So like, I'll tell you about when you catch a swarm, when you get the queen inside of the box, like I use yeah. a, a queen cage, just like a little clip, like a hair clip. If when I put that queen clip inside the box and those few bees that see her go in, they'll smell her and they'll fan her pheromones. I'll, I've seen them do about face and everybody go into the box. Yeah, they'll literally walk into the box. And it's the easiest thing to do because they're doing all the work. You catch the queen, which I guess I'm older now, so I, I don't have the eyesight I once did. That's where Lane comes in. Lane's job on a swarm is to find the queen. And he finds the queen. He could put in a queen clip. He and he does a really good job of that. That's awesome. And and so have a lot of pheromone based things and a lot of vibrations. And then they also do dances, right, to give directions. What yeah. what would happen if you needed directions and you got out of the car to ask someone for directions and they started dancing for you? I think that would be kind of funny. I think you should do it one time. <clears throat> Yeah, so communication is pretty cool there. Yeah. And uh, most of the bees we see are female, right? Yep. The only males in the colony is the drone, and they provide absolutely nothing to the colony they belong to. They're just freeloaders. <laughs> T typical men, right? S sperm donors? <laughs> yeah. So, what I mean, basically, what they do is, and like in wintertime, the, they'll kick all the drones out. And like the drones from, let's say, Hive A, when Hive B's new queen emerges and she goes on a mating flight, the drones will mate her, but they will not mate their own queen. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Steve says honey is legal as a cottage food. I thought that was what it was under. <clears throat> uh, Bob says we buy raw, unfiltered five gallon buckets of wildflower honey from Eastern Arizona Company. That's a lot. That's a lot. I'm just going to read some of these. Uh, bee guards on hummingbird feeders. You've seen them? Oh, boy. Oh, you can mail cactus fruit to Colorado. Okay. 
Okay. I just seeing if we have any more bee questions. What is the life expectancy of a worker bee? So life expectancy of a worker bee is somewhere between 30 and 60 days. That's you're going to be, yeah, you're going to be averaging six weeks average, but it could be as soon as 30, as long as 60. Um, what is incubation, if we can call it that, or gestation? What do you call it when it's a bee? <laughs> um, I think somewhere around 13 days, something like that. Okay. And what about the queen? Like, are they, is there different like life expectancies for different types? I would say queens four to five years for a queen. And wow. she, she only goes on one mating flight in her life. Okay. And then she'll get it's mated enough. Days old. <laughs> yep. And she can actually lay up to 50,000 eggs a day. No wonder they can push them through so quick. <laughs> Jeez. I, I wish Those I could get small eggs. I wish I could get quail to do that. <laughs> I don't think you can uh, do a hybrid. Yeah. I Although try. I have been told my quail's eggs are sweet by, by someone. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, Jay says, in my region, we have several small bee operations, and they have paired with the high school to train the next generation of teens to do career business and beekeeping. I wish we were that smart here, because I think we need more agricultural and school connection. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Bob says, thanks, Aaron, for sharing bee knowledge. Wish I could have a hive. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for stopping in, Bob. Yeah. Um, Andy says I had fly bait last summer I never saw but a dead bee around it so they must be smart enough to stay away from it it's also not the scent that they're going after um, yeah and they're, they're highly product. attuned to you know pheromones and scents and all of that um, I know if you guys okay so I put it up on the on the Facebook group a while back um, at something to watch when I was not putting a video. <laughs> and I don't know how many people watched it, but um, what plants talk about is a something you can find on YouTube. It's it's uh, nature, I think, did it? Um, PBS, something like that. And some of what they talk about is how just a very one little small por portion of that was talking about how there's a wild tobacco plant, which has a pollinator that is a hummingbird. And then over a course of seven or eight days, once it's um, back up, has a pollinator that is a sphinx moth, which is the hornworm. And mm -hmm. so once it gets overrun with hornworm, it's calling out with its pheromones to get the wasps to come in and you know take care of that problem. But then within seven to eight days, all the flowers turn over and they change shape. They change um, scent and the nectar changes and that attracts hummingbirds. So like there's this whole language with plants and, and with bees. And so I think the bees are really going to the ones, the plants that they're supposed to go to. There's this whole uh, ecology and evolution between certain plants and certain pollinators and bees pollinate a lot of plants. <laughs> Yeah, so we have a ton of elderberry, and yes. the bees really don't forage in the elderberry flowers. Pawpaws are um, are pollinated by flies. People hang dead things in pawpaw trees to get better pollination. <laughs> they should just raise quail next to them. There you go. There you go. All right, Ken wants to know, if a worker bee dies in the hive, what do the other bees do with the dead worker bee? I think Christina answered it. They have uh, undertaker bees that they they their job is to clean out the hive. So any any pollen that was dropped or any even like a dead mite, um a dead beetle or a dead bee, they'll just throw them out the hive. You it's fun and to watch. Save you can just see them. Yeah, they just like to walk out to the entrance with them and just throw them up the ledge. Can they sting after they're dead? I'm sure they can. I'm sure they can. 
Yeah, I'm sure they can because the stinger's still there. I don't know if the venom would actually come out, and I guess right. depending right. on the time frame of when they die. In. Right. Okay. I get stung enough when they're alive, so. <laughs> Serena says, "What do bees say as they part company?" I'll be seeing you. <laughs> All right. Christina says, I looked it up one day and I saw one carrying out. Oh, I looked up one day and saw one carrying out a dead bee. Wow. Yeah. I mean, they have every single job. It seems to me like insects have a more well organized society than any other group <laughs> of animals on the planet. I don't know why that is, but ants, bees, I mean, all these guys, they're so advanced. Yeah, they are. They're really super intelligent. <laughs> Ken wants to know what bee eats for dessert. Honey, Honey buns. Christine says, I know bee stuff, but I'm not currently talking to any of the bees. They, they're getting the silent treatment from me after last week's incident. He shared we, a picture of, of you with me. We researched the bees that. together for, for years. Christine and I researched the bees together. Mm -hmm. And then we got the bees and she kind of, she stays at a distance and she videos then one removal out of out of a local sawmill they had we did a bee removal and she was a good distance away and lane was running back to her because he was so excited so he was running back to her to explain to her what we were doing and he brought a bee back with them she was in the middle of video and i think that, that video is on the youtube she is didn't want like she didn't want to put ones? yes she didn't want to put yeah she didn't want to put that part of the video Oh, and I was like, this is too funny to not put on. She's yeah. running. She dropped the phone. It was it was hilarious. Oh, my goodness. Serena says, what does a bee groom his hair with? Honeycomb. My goodness. Yeah. And most insects are smarter than humans, Verna says. That's kind of what I was getting at with the society yeah. stuff. I mean, they do their job, and they might only do their job, but they're really good at doing their job. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, all right. What are the ongoing so startup costs and ongoing costs of beekeeping? So the startup costs aside from the actual bees themselves, yes, your startup cost is gonna be anywhere between five hundred and a thousand dollars for your all your equipment. I mean a bee suit. A, a bee a bee suit is gonna cost you because you don't want to be cheap on a bee suit, especially if you don't like to get stung by bees. Are there cheap bee suits that you should not buy? Do those exist? Like the ones? If you order a bee starter kit from like somewhere like Man Lake or something like that, the suit that comes in there with them, it's not good. They, they could sting you through it. Not good. I prefer, okay. I prefer just wearing a veil protecting my head and latex gloves. I don't really like to wear a suit because it's super hot and <laughs> you should invent one with some ice packs or the fan. Yeah. So Lane Lane's behind the camera and he's insisting Hi. he's insisting I show you these. So Christina oh. what is this goes around her neck to wear inside the bee suits to cool us off. I've seen those. Those work, huh? Yeah, they're rechargeable. That's awesome. I just have a solar powered fan hat, but that doesn't work when you have a bee suit on, probably. Yeah. Um, as far as the maintenance costs on bees, once you get them established and you're not uh, buying sugar to make sugar water to feed them, you mm -hmm. really don't have any costs. You don't have to feed them. In a colder climate, you would definitely want to do some kind of candy board on your top end to give them overwinter food. Don't get too aggressive harvesting honey to let them have honey over winter. I left um, at least one honey super on top of every hive. 
for for the winter and they hardly ate anything because we only had that two days of cold and then we had flowers blooming so they had enough to forage yeah the winter time for other places would definitely have some different um things and i know they have like i don't remember what they call it but it's like a little cake of food yeah is that a pollen a pollen patty pollen patty is that what's called yeah yeah <laughs> oh boy oh boy um Verna says, Aaron, that shows how dedicated to you Christina is. <laughs> she definitely supports the bees. And look, I'll be, I'll be honest and say after she got stung in the face, when we were sitting in the emergency room, I I said, look, I said, I could get rid of all the bee stuff. You know, like I'm, I'm not going to have, we're not going to be miserable just to keep the bees. And she was against getting rid of them. She was like, we we're keeping bees. So yeah, I'll do all that. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll do a few splits this this week and make more hives so we can have more bees. Do, does splitting a hive, um, you have to have a queen when you split a hive already, right? No. No? How does that work? I have a few hives with queen cells, so they'll be looking to make a new queen, so I'm going to take those queen cells and some brood frames and okay. some honey frames. And I'm going to move them over to a new hive. And typically when you do a split, you're going to want to, because my boxes are stacked up on top of each other. I have like two inches in between each box, just enough to get the covers on and off. But when you do a split, you want to move your split as far away as possible Makes sense. from your existing hive. That way, because their internal GPSs are honed into that one specific hive, just so you don't cause any confusion for them. They just move back home. <laughs> yeah, they'll just move back home. And then, okay. so when I do my splits, I take them, I'll take them from the animal yard and I move them and I call it the garden bees, which Christina hates when I do that. Because then it's right by a gate to get into the animal yard. So you have to walk right in front of the hive. <laughs> oh boy. Um, so when you when they have a new when you split it and they have they're like, okay, we have no leader, we must make a leader. Let's feed this little baby something else. It's gonna be royal jelly. What's in royal jelly that's different that makes them the way they are? Um how are they different? Do they look different? Are they put in a different place? So they actually have a queen cell that they put an egg in and then they feed it the royal jelly, which I lost interest in learning about royal jelly when it just happens. <laughs> someone made me try tasting royal jelly. And royal jelly does not taste good. Um, so how is it different though? That they make it a different way? I'm not sure. Like, so when I first started asking questions about bees and, and somebody like gave me a little Royal jelly to try, I was like, I'll, I'll never try this again. It was kind of like sour. I don't know. I can't explain it. So I never really got interested on in how they make it. I know the bees actually produce it, mm -hmm. but I never really, I don't know. I'm very weak when it comes to like food taste. I have heard that almond um, honey is not good, not like yummy. And I've had a bunch of different kinds of honey. I mean, they say wildflower honey and clover honey and all this, but when they put them, you know, into a cherry orchard or orange orchard or avocado honey is really, really good. Yeah. Um, you can get different, different hints of, or not just hints, but, full-on flavors from these different um, honeys as well. Um, I just found that interesting because it's it's got to be the pollen because that's the only part they take. <laughs> yeah, so like different seasons will bring you different, um, like for our, our area, different pollen and so the honey will taste different. Like right now, they are primarily foraging on clover. So mm -hmm. I'll have a few of the clover honey, which is more of a lighter color. It's, it's almost like a clear. And then oh, yeah. as the season progresses, when they start 
gathering different flowers then it'll be a little darker then towards the fall you end up with like the the ragweed and stuff like that which some people are totally against it but it didn't taste that bad right i had poison oak jelly and that was actually not jelly um honey and that is how they do this and i, I asked them is like they know that the majority of the four they they can't say oh this is 100 percent whatever right but the majority of the forage comes from this and they know where the bees forage and all that but that was a very interesting flavored one yeah yeah i don't know if i don't know if i would like that one i don't know it's if it's very different i mean like any of the any of the like i love the the clover honey mm -hmm. the light and super sweet that's like what's typically in the in the stores and it's either wildflower or clover yeah. Yeah. Well, a lot of that store stuff is watered down. It's still honey. Like most of it's honey, but it's watered down. So we have raw honey and we have non raw honey. Why does non raw honey, I don't, can't think of what it's called now. Um, yeah. Why does it exist? Because honey is already honey. Yeah. So that the non raw honey would be your processed stuff that they, they're adding sugar water to to kind of. Thin it out, and then I mean, in essence, they're doubling their money. Okay, and then once it once it's been cooked, it's basically what they do. It is they yeah. they heat it. Then a lot of the properties go away, right? Yeah, yeah. Once you once you heat honey, then you lose the the good medicinal properties from it. And what medicinal properties does it have? So I mean, this is you know. Everybody always says like local honey will help you with your allergies and stuff like that, which we we have so much pollen in the air these days that I don't know if anything could help. <laughs> you just don't know how good you have it, <laughs> right? Yeah. Oh. I have honey every day, so I don't know. Is it antiviral too? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, antibacterial. So, like, if you had like an open wound, you could use the honey and just slather it on there to help stop the bleeding. Yeah, there's manuka honey, which is not where we are. That's Australia. Yeah. Right. So, certain kinds of honey can have additional properties. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Ken, do not sting yourself to get your immunity up. That's not <laughs> not recommended. No. Um, can you tell drone eggs from worky, worker bee eggs? So can you look at a cell? So you said the queen cell, but you didn't explain like what it looks like. like how do you know it's a queen cell? And then so, like, can you tell the difference between the different things that come out? So the queen cell won't be built into the hexagon of the comb. It'll usually be built outside protruding and it'll look like a little ball on the outside or like a bigger teardrop. Okay. On the hexagon in the comb, a drone will be a bigger diameter, and it it won't be as perfect as your normal honeycomb. And we don't so care like, about this guy; he just needs to reproduce and leave. Is that what? Is that yeah. what this is? So, <laughs> like some sometimes you'll end up with a queen that's laying a lot of drone eggs. So that. That, that's one thing I look at when I'm doing a hive inspection to see what my drone cell count is. And those if are I'm, bigger. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it, it just simply, I just, I'll just pull a frame out. If there's a ton of drone cells on it, I'll pull it out and just put it in the freezer. Okay. So I know from here, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of flowers that the bees love right now. They are absolutely loving the borage. They absolutely love all the fruit trees, you know, when they're fruiting, but the borage has them like in the yard all the time now. Um, and I know Russian sage is another one. Do you find that there are certain flowers or wildflowers or planted flowers that they will tend towards other than, you know, rather than others, more than others? I'm trying to remember what Christina's blue flower was last year. Christina, was that the the blue peas or oh the uh, I know which one you're talking about the one you, you use for tea 
Yellow flower, yeah. yeah. cilantro flowers. <laughs> oh, my favorite cilantro. Yeah, herbs yeah. That is like flowering. here they like the herbs a lot. Ooh, marjoram. They love my marjoram. Um, the dill and the parsley, and the cilantro. But Christina grew this blue flower last year. They they, they like the blue flowers. Blue butterfly pea flowers. There you go. That's yeah, what I, was I, I knew it was blue, and I knew <laughs> she was out there picking them all the time. Right. Cosmos. Yeah, Cosmos. See, Christina's in the garden more than I am, so. Uh, we we can hear your pre your uh, prompts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Christina. <laughs> she she's a professional beekeeper that doesn't beekeep. She she could do it, but she's a bee non-keeper. Yeah. <laughs> she knows everything that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. She just doesn't get along with the bees. Okay. <laughs> uh, buckwheat honey is Verna's favorite. I'm just going to go through these. Don't get too far behind. Uh, oh, Jay says, according to Bee Time website, Royal Jelly has a distinctive aroma and slightly spicy, acidic, sweet taste. Interesting combination. Others have described it as somewhat astringent, slightly bitter, dry, and leaving. Okay. That means terrible. That's your description? Yep, terrible. It's terrible. It's just terrible. Okay. Um, Ken says, are, so are bees in the hive down the street cousins to the bees in your backyard hive? Potentially. I think we might have to check a family tree on that one. <laughs> okay. Okay. Oh, leaving an aftertaste. Jay wasn't done. Sometimes this aftertaste is equated with very low levels of bee venom, thus imparting a tingling or numbing sensation to the mouth and tongue. So maybe they add bee venom to the honey. Who who dies for the queen to live? Jeez. Because <laughs> bees die when they sting, right? I wonder if they can squeeze it without stinging oh. hi mister lane we met lane's been, lane's been patiently waiting now he's getting ready for bed he's in his pajamas his, with his pikachu welcome I tell him what's your favorite bee story hi. lane what did you say? what's your favorite bee story that we our first one. Oh, the our first <laughs> bee removal so um at the sawmill. Yeah. This is my favorite. Long doctor phone. <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite part. It, it was fun because because mom ran and dropped her phone? Yeah. Okay. And maybe we'll you that wonder that was recording. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we hear that you're the one that brought her the bee. Yeah, I might have. <laughs> Did you learn to run the other way when that happens? No. He still no. goes see his mom. But she stands <laughs> so far away, so he likes to go tell her what's going on. I go halfway in. Then. As he walkie talkies. Yeah. yeah, now he goes halfway. Okay. Okay. That's good. That's good. Tell everybody bye. Bye. Good night. He didn't have to question what his favorite story was, huh? That was it. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah, I have a I have a funny bee removal story from last year, because all right, go for it. It's fresh, it's fresh on my mind because they called me um, this week or last week. Yeah, at a local cemetery um, in Louisiana. So we're we're at sea level. So when they bury bodies, they put them above the ground in mausoleums. Oh, and I'm friends with a caretaker for a cemetery. She called me up and she said, we have bees everywhere. I need you to come look everywhere. So I leapt into action, loaded up bee boxes, put my bee suit on, went there. And, you know, in the, the cracks in between, like each grave site, the bees were coming in and out. And she was like, well, we'll remove it and you could get the bees and then we'll put it back. And I was like, well, what is behind that? And she was like, 
um, it might be a coffin or sometimes they put just the body in a bag. Mm -hmm. So I was like, well, I'm not going to get those bees because I'm, I'm, I'm not going in there with the. Right. Right. It's not your time yet. (laughs) What human remains for bees. I was like, we'll just leave them alone. So I have seen where they do, um, they do this every once, every few years the, down the street or a couple blocks away, there's a, there's an elm tree that has a hole in it that the bees come in every few years and every few years, you know, sometimes they let it be there. And then sometimes they have a, a collector, I don't know what it's called, but they rope it off and they have this thing sitting there with a sign. And basically they have a thing that they're supposed to go into. Yeah, like a swarm trap. A swarm trap. Okay, yeah. and it's like a two. It's like attached to the tree, but how does that work? They just don't so, have another way out. So that that's like a trap out situation, and typically, what you want to do is you want to restrict the entrance or exit from the tree. Mm-hmm. And I've seen some people do it with like tubing from the hole in the tree going into the swarm trap. That's what this was. Or some people will take like a, a just a regular kitchen funnel and they'll put it backwards onto the tree, tape it on there where the bees could come out, but okay. they can't fly back in. So right on side of the entrance, you put a nuke with some um, some frames in there that already already drawn comb on it, honey preferably. So when the foragers come back, they can't get back into the hive, so they go into the box and then Eventually, the queen will notice that the population's going down, so she'll We're come out and, <laughs> and she'll hop in. Okay. And then once they know they have the queen, they go live somewhere yep. else. Okay. Yep. I always wondered how that how that actually worked because I've seen it. I just didn't know all the intricacies. Yeah, it's definitely yeah. one of the hardest ways to get bees. But it's probably the most peaceful way of doing it in an area that they need to go away from according yeah. to people. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's better than killing the hive. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Amy. Um, Ken is asking, okay, what do you do if a bee gets inside your house? Catch it and bring it out. With a cup or something. Catch it. How yeah. I catch spiders. <laughs> Just catch it with your hand and bring it out. Just not like not like this. No, no. Gentle. Yeah. Usually the quail born's right next to the bees, and at night there'll be a few bees in the quail born attracted to the light, and I'll bring one in on my shirt or my hat and not notice till I get inside. And they just usher them out. Yeah. Just bring them okay. out. Um eating bee pollen is something that I've seen more recently and Serena uh, has a question about that. Does it really work to reduce allergies to that kind of pollen? I I've seen this sold here for the past like 10 years. But before that, I don't think I ever heard about it. I don't think I ever was around areas that were so abundant in bees though. Um, Opinions. It's not something I do. Everyone I talk to that does use the pollen, I mean, they, they claim success from it. It's just not something I do. Just, yeah, I, I've seen I've seen videos of what they, like these little things they put on the entrance to the hive to get that. And it just seems, to me, I don't know whether it works or not. It, it makes sense that if you're inoculating yourself with something small that it would help somewhat but you're also stealing a lot of that pollen so i'm wondering how that affects the hive i don't, I don't think it would really affect it that much not it wouldn't cause any issues okay i'm just i'm i'm super particular on taste of foods <laughs> So like that's that's a no from me. Yeah, bee pollen, I've ha- I've had it, and it's not um, all bee pollen is is these little granules like that big, mm. and it literally is what they shoved in their little cargo pocket. 
in their in their what did you call it? In their leg? Pollen pants. Pollen pants. <laughs> yeah. And uh and it pops out and that's what you're eating is literally the pollen that has collected on their leg um when they're out foraging. So it doesn't taste particularly good to me. Whether it does something, I don't know. Um, I don't have very many allergies to plants. Um, yeah. Hey, Kelly says, thanks for all the bee knowledge. So excited to go into my second year. Awesome. I'm so glad you got into that and you're getting into Muscovy ducks and all that. That's awesome. <laughs> what, what, do, what do you call the chore list the queen gives the drone? A honeydew list. <laughs> uh, Amy says sting is for arthritis. So that's used the, the, uh, the uh, venom is used for arthritis. Yeah, that, that's what I, I heard that the bee stings help with arthritis. I wish it would help with carpal tunnel syndrome. Have you really tried though? <laughs> yes, I have. <laughs> Put them here, 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 here. Yeah. yeah. That's a tough one. All right. Ken says, uh, does that stuff they spray to control mosquitoes affect bees in different ways? I think it just kills them. Yeah. Right? It, you, you'll see, like, when they do spray the next day or two, you'll see some bees that they look very lethargic and they'll have what's called K wing where their wings won't go back in position and it'll kind of have the shape of a K and usually that's a sign of a bee being poison. Is that a neurological? Yeah. It's a neurotoxin for them. Okay. And um, they won't, see, they see, won't go back to the hive. Right. They, they know they're dead. They know they're bad. Yeah. Your, your job is done. <laughs> yeah. You'll be replaced in 13 days. <laughs> yeah. Um, Steve's asking if you took a drone cell out of one hive and put it in another, would they kill those or they become a part of the new hive? So I guess your question really is about incorporation of other, like if you were to take some cells out of, or some, what are these things called? The frames. Yeah. Some frames out of one into another yeah. one. If you're going to like try and beef up one of the colonies, do they so accept those? Bees are really particular on the order of everything. Okay. So you don't want to mix frames up, but in like a situation with a weak colony, you can take brood frames out of one hive and add those brood frames to the other hive to help them up the numbers in the hive faster than the queen could produce that get them kick started. Right. Okay. So you, it can be done. If if you're really in need, but if you're not really in need, don't do it. Yeah, I, I wouldn't do drones. Drones are right. useless. <laughs> and Steve has a good point here. It's a good point, Steve. Aaron, the royal jelly tasted bad to you because you are not the queen bee. I am not the queen bee. And Verna loves your hat. It has a quail on it. That's all I can see. Ah, there we go. There we go. Um, Scabiosa and Zinnia or a couple other flowers Amy is suggesting. Yep. I'm, I'm not well versed in flowers. <laughs> so just flowers in general. Like I'll, I'll walk through a garden with Christina. I'm like, oh, that's a pretty flower. And she's like, she's, she'll tell me the name. I'm like, yeah, I won't remember that. Oh, Verna, Verna says, no, it wasn't your hat she liked. It was Lane's hat. Oh, Lane's hat. <laughs> His little hat. Um, Andy says, bee venom cream I use is good for that, and there is no hurting from the stinger. Good for carpal tunnel or good for arthritis? And Ken is asking, do almond growers rent beehives to pollinate them? Yes, they do. So mm -hmm. Ken, Ken's in California as well. If you drive through Central Valley and let's say the San Joaquin Valley and you will see and I don't understand why they put the hives right on the side of the freeway because you go through there and you smash so many bees and I always feel bad. And I'm like, you guys just 
put them back at the other end of, of the orchard. Um, but yeah, they, it's a big business mm -hmm. and it's so big that they get stolen sometimes so that they can be re-rented to other people or to the same people by the people who steal them. So there's like, there's drama in the world of bees, at least in, in the region where we are, Ken. Um, I don't know about other regions how much of an issue that part is, but yeah, that is part of the cost when you are eating almonds or, um, you know, citrus, anything that grows on a tree, um, you know, fruit wise from the store likely has either someone is raising their own bees or they rent the bees and these bees can travel quite a distance. I don't know how far they travel, but they do travel around the country. Um, do you know how far some of these guys travel? Um, there, there are some big bee farms in South Carolina that ship bees to California for like avocados yeah. and almond season. Yeah. It's a seasonal thing that, I mean, they, they go quite a ways, um, for sure. I know. And in, in fact, I know in California, so California is number, number, I, I believe our number one, um, output, um, for money wise, uh, is agriculture and people don't really think of California as that, but it's big, big agriculture. We're on, on the scale of other countries in what our output is. And I know when the colony collapse stuff started happening, that was a really, really, really big concern, not only because it was happening, but also because the crops that rely, the amount of crops that rely on rented uh, bees is huge. And these bees do travel and they do pick up things and all of this. And I know that there was discussions and I did not follow up on what the results were of any of this, but there were discussions about um, some sort of regulation within California of that because they didn't want the native populations of bees and the native bumblebees and the native, you know, other bees to get whatever was causing the colony collapse. So this is back when we didn't really know kind of what we know now because we do know more now than we did before. Um, and I don't know what that, I don't know what actually happened to that. I just know that was a discussion point that was being um, held several years ago. So since I just brought that up, <laughs> you want to talk about colony collapse? And, and uh, I, I don't know, it's not an issue everywhere. And then I also want to bring up, I did see years ago there was a an article that I read about bees and uh, colony collapse specifically, kind of in the beginning when they didn't really know what was causing things. Um, and there was there were studies that followed these bees, and they were going into old growth forests, and so obviously in the Pacific, um, Pacific Northwest, and they were going to old growth forests. And they were getting the water that, that was off of mushrooms on these old growth trees. And so they started studying that and it kind of came to find out that there was this relationship with these old growth fungi, um, fungi on old growth trees that was boosting the immune system of, of these bees. And I know since then there's been tons of more information regarding fungus and bees and health and all of that and you remember you know. who wrote that article or who did I, study? it was so long ago i don't recall oh damn I it i very clearly remember it yeah. yeah i think you're talking about the article written by paul stamets okay he, yeah he's a mycologist in based out of washington yeah he, he studies the the effects of mushrooms and like with the bees and stuff like that. He then posted an article, actually a few of them. I like to read sometimes. <laughs> when it's interesting, right? Yeah. So what is, what is colony collapse caused by? It, it could be a number of things. Your, your top two would be varroa mites and pesticides. 
So there was a mite outbreak and were there were there particular pesticides, you know, that were being used? I know in California we just got rid of in the last five years, I want to say we just got rid of um, a couple of big ones that were used on strawberries and uh, berries. I think there were some berry specific, berry specific um, pesticides that are no longer legal. They're finding all sorts of cancers in people and all of this. I'm wondering if some of that attributed to that. So I'm I'm not a chemist, um, <laughs> but it. From everything I read, it seems like the um, nicotine-based pesticides cause okay. the most harm to bees because uh, nicotine is a big chemical and pesticides. Right. That makes sense because nicotine is a is a neuro, right? A neurotoxin. Is that yeah. what it is? It, I think that's what it is. Yeah, it's it's something neurolog neurological that. And it's it's nicotine stuff mostly, which it's used in a lot of pesticides. But I I don't think that we fully have the research on some of those pesticides that are being used on, on the long term effects of things. I don't For think anybody. we've been yeah I don't I don't think we've been using some of the, some of these pesticides long enough to know the long term effects. And maybe we shouldn't. <laughs> well. Some of the stuff, and the good news is you'll never find out the long-term effects because you won't live long enough to see it. <laughs> I guess so. I guess. Yeah. Oh, boy. Yeah, we won't get into that. Not not on this live yet. Not on this live? <laughs> no. We'll, we'll make another one to talk about chemicals. <laughs> oh, boy. Well... Um, oh, Steve, no, they only have the beehives on one side of the orchard. I've been on other sides of orchards. Um, it's only they, well, I think what they do is it's easiest to just take it off the highway, park it right there, unload it, and go up, go back. They just don't want to spend the time. It's probably cheap for them because they'll make they'll make more bees, yeah. And yeah. like the, the ship, the um, shipping cross country on 18 wheels for the beehives. And I mean, you know, how many beehives you could put on one 18 wheeler. And ship it across it. the country. It's it's huge, and that's a big market. And I actually watched a documentary on the, the bee stealing and re re renting yeah. bee hives. I was I was like, wow, what all the things to steal? You stealing bee hives? But I guess it's big business. It's big business, and there's no security. Yeah, I'm not saying go steal bee hives, guys. I'm saying if you have bee hives and you're renting them out, be careful. <laughs> Any, if anyone wants to come steal a hive I have a purple one, solid purple box all the way on the end, take that one that's, that's the dangerous one? oh, I yeah. mean, that's the <laughs> that's Christina's hive oh, boy oh, this is a good question Ken says, are there any schools that teach beekeeping skills and beehive maintenance how do you learn about bee husband husbandry, I think is what you're trying to say so I know like I'm in Louisiana and LSU is big in the agriculture side of things. And I know they host beekeeping classes and I know for information, the beekeeping community is very helpful. That's one thing I can tell you. Like I've noticed like over time, like Facebook groups and stuff, people are super friendly and helpful. You definitely like I'm sure every area has its own beekeeping club. You could join. Okay. Usually the dues are very cheap. You could join there. You could Then you have a com close community to reach out to if you have any trouble. Um, I've, I gained a lot of knowledge watching David Burns on YouTube. He is super patient and very knowledgeable on everything B and like he really breaks things down to if you have zero understanding of beekeeping or a good bit, I think you could learn a lot from him. It's the way he explains things. Right. There are local um in California there I don't know I don't remember the name of it, but they we there is a California group and I think there's it's kind of like there's a group and then there's chapters. Um yeah. 
and I don't remember the name of it, but it does exist. And I think you would probably find it pretty quick by typing things into the internet. Um, yeah. Yeah. And Steve says, so the bee community is almost as good as the quail community? Almost, Steve. Almost. Yeah, thieves work at night when bees are less active. So are people. Um, yeah, I've seen these trucks. You see them quite often if you're in the Central Valley, in, in the San Joaquin Valley, which is the big valley in the middle of California. You see them quite often. And they have this net of, like, tiny holes it's clamped down pretty well. There's usually some stragglers outside of it. And <laughs> and there's usually some up against it. Like, and you just feel bad for them because like, I was gonna eat something today. <laughs> that's that's how I see them when I'm looking at them. They just they're not actually squished up against it, but they look like they are. But you see these huge trucks that I mean they just they go all over. They go all over. Yeah. Yeah. That that's interesting because I mean, you're renting out the hive for pollination, then you're getting your hive back and mm -hmm. it'll be full of honey. So you can turn around and sell the honey. I mean, it, Unless it's, it's almond. Yeah, almond honey. But they have it. I mean, I know. Where was it? I read another thing where they were trying. They, I don't know who they was, but uh, somebody was trying to develop a bee robot to see how like how that would work and you know all that and they built one that it worked but it was way too expensive <laughs> and it did not work nearly as efficiently as the actual animal I'm like why would you mess with this are we trying to find something in case the bees are no longer there um i know for me i a lot of the high agricultural areas in the san joaquin valley in, in california um the there's trees and then it's denuded underneath right you, you're talking about orchards there's fields of tomatoes that are just tomato and then they're going to rake it all up you know and uh you know throw it away burn it whatever um so there aren't really like you're, you're starting to see more um what are they called like the end caps where there's flowers planted um you're starting to see more of that where there's pollinator um, refugia, but mm -hmm. it's coming very slowly. And I know the, the bees that you usually see out there are not native bees. And I think it's because that other forage just doesn't exist. Um, and then like in my yard, there's many different species of bees. I mean, I have from the carpenter bees, which are the big bumble carpenter bees. They're like that big down to little tiny ones that fit in a nail hole on my front gate they're so funny they're there every year i have four little holes from where i put the gate latch in the wrong place and i had to move it over and little holes and they live in there with the little butts hanging out and then i open the gate and i close the gate and you know the gate goes like this you know and they kind of fly out and then fly right back in <laughs> they're like no we're living here uh so i think that's what's happening at least there in the in the high ag areas is i think people are scared of losing honeybees because we don't have we've kind of run off the native ones to a large extent in those areas yeah there's there's nothing for them to forage on so they're not going to stay right right and and now we just have four different um bumblebees that uh are being listed under Endangered Species Act, there, um, I don't think they're listed yet. But so we have to now, I'm a wildlife biologist, we have to look at that and look at the habitat for that, those species. And I think if if the native bees are going down, um, it is important that we keep our honeybees healthy <laughs> for our own food consumption. Yeah. Um, we don't want to be out there with chicken feathers pollinating everything, you know. No, because before bees, Christina was out there with paintbrushes pollinating yeah. the squash. That that's a that's a big job. <laughs> yeah, I've heard makeup brushes work best. Yeah, I don't know what kind of brush. I think it, like the small paint brushes she used. Not sure. 
makeup brushes get they have the small smaller things and they pick up more and they they pick up more that stays on the brush because i know when i try those little cheap little paint brushes you know the little kid paint brushes mm -hmm. i would pick it up and then like you'd see it fall as i go into the next thing <laughs> but yeah we don't want to do that hey ed's here sorry i'm late ed do you have any questions about bees for aaron that's what we're talking about it says, I see you, Aaron. <laughs> and I hope you're you're cooling off. Oh, did he get hot? Yeah. It only got to 60s here. So, yeah. It kind of, I think it was 86 today here. Wow. It's warm. Wow. Well, do you have any more? Uh, oh, what's the best? Oh, pro what? Oh. Steve. Um, so what is the best and worst advice you've heard uh, people give about bee raising bees? 89, goodness. Best advice? I don't know. The, be the best advice probably came from Christina. <laughs> Run! Uh, with being, we have enough hives. So have uh, extra hives? Well, she said we had enough. I need to stop expanding. That's probably the oh. best advice. Um, I don't know if I don't know if I've really given been given bad advice. I haven't been, really been given much advice, to be honest. Is there advice you've heard people give other people? I've try, I'm trying to um, kind of fish for like maybe something that's common or someone that something that someone might hear, and then you have opinions on if that exists. So probably one big controversial topic would be a queen excluder. Okay. So some people it's kind of it's kind of like the the queen excluder people or die hard queen excluders. And you got people like me like I don't have one. I don't use and The or, reason for using a queen excluder would be so to that keep you don't the, pressure? to keep the queen in the brood box and not let her go up into the honey frames. But my rationale behind not having a queen excluder is if she wants to lay that many eggs, I'm just going to have a big colony. I'll let her go into the honey frames and and lay eggs. I'd rather her laying eggs than not laying eggs. Right. Right. Okay. That makes sense. I mean, so someone who's using a, a queen excluder is someone who is absolutely just going after honey and doesn't want that honey to be used doesn't want their honey to be used for brooding yeah is that kind of the idea yeah which has its place you know yeah, depending absolutely. on what you're, you're going after but yeah so free free range queen <laughs> yeah just don't squish her don't squish her Ed has another good advice. Don't run up and kick the hive. Yeah, it's pretty smart. <laughs> I, I cut grass right in front of my hive, like three feet in front of my hive with a weed eater. And they're okay with that? Yeah, just don't stop. Okay. So the threat is okay as long as it's in passing. Yeah. That's funny. That's kind of similar. We do some hawk surveys from, and it's from a car. Like the, the protocol is doing it from a vehicle. And when I first saw that, I'm like, well, that's lazy. But what they, you know, internalize a little further, they don't recognize a car as an animal. They recognize in a threat. They recognize a person as an animal and a threat. So probably that constant motion that is not directed at them is not directed at them. Whereas if you were to stop right next to it, they'd be like, oh my gosh, something big and scary came and it's here. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah makes sense. Yeah. I know, Steve. That's why I said it that way. It's not their honey. It's the bees' honey. 
Yeah. Okay. Well, does anybody have some questions for Aaron? He has given us all the tools we need to have these, I think. Are there any questions that are have not been asked? Anything you want to impart your knowledge upon the people? <laughs> um, I think bees are fun. I, I recommend everyone, at least if you can't have bees, plant a habitat for bees. And if you're really looking into pollinators and you're not allowed with restrictions to have bees, you could look into having a mason bee colony. That's the ones that have like the little houses with the little bamboo shoots. And so they're a great pollinator. They won't produce any honey for you, but it's still a pollinator. Right. And, and we, we need pollinators. But if you know somebody who does have bees around you, definitely plant some flowers for them to forage. Or even if you don't have bees around, just flowers help. Right. Companion planting different things around your vegetable garden will attract more bee activity and not necessarily even honeybees just other pollinators even the dreaded red wasp is also a pollinator i mean i don't like them that's a pollinator so it's it's a good thing to have right well without, without pollinators we won't last long and there's a, a movie about a town that Pesticide its pollinators to death, and that's that's where the chicken feather pollinating comes from. Mm -hmm. I don't remember the name of it. If I remember the name of it, I will put it in the. Um, I'll try and search for it. I'll put the name in the in the Facebook group. But this town, the whole town, I mean, they use pesticides. They didn't know what they were doing, and all their pollinators are gone. And so they, the whole town was out pollinating with chicken feathers, and it's let the bees do the job <laughs> yeah de definitely let let the bees do work and like so i have quail and everyone on here that has quail knows that i also have flies because i have quail so but like they're not attracted to the quick strike i use i use quick strike for the flies they're not attracted to it i have fly bags they're not attracted to that um, so it's, you have a way you could get rid of those pests because anyone who tells me a fly is useful, I don't, I just, I don't know if I can have a good conversation with them. For feeding spiders. Yeah. Well, not by the millions. You just don't have uh, enough spiders. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I need more spiders. Oh, Yeah. All right, well, um, let us know what else is going on. And you have a website um, and yeah. a farm, and you sell things. So let us know yeah. what you're up to, what you're selling, what's what's going on. Yeah, and then I'll start being more active on YouTube. Um, we're just been, we've been so busy the last few weeks that it's been kind of it. difficult. Yeah, I get it. I don't think we, I don't think we did a garden tour since we put stuff in the ground. It's been three weeks. Oh, three weeks. So definitely lacking on that department. Didn't have a bee sting yeah. <laughs> Christina was out of commission for a week with my bees with her bee sting for my bees. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Verna posted the website. Thank you, Verna. Thank you, Verna. It's also in the description of the video. So if someone's looking for it and for some reason can't see the chat, that's what it is. What is beeswax used for? Um, you can use for beeswax for, for a ton of things. We use it for Christina makes some salves and we use it for candles. It's also used for toilet rings. Yeah, toilet rings. What is it actually called? The thing that you set the toilet on between that goes between the toilet and the and the, the wa wax seal. Yeah, wax, wax. Seal. Yeah, wax seal. Like yeah. a big gasket. Yeah. Yeah, and then you could also use it. So I use the the plastic corrugated um, middle of my frames. 
And after you harvest honey off of it, you could heat up wax and paint it on. That way they have wax to get started back building comb. That makes sense. That makes sense. They, they come wax colder and most of the time it's okay. But if you have extra wax, that's a good thing. So okay. so many different uh, different uses of it. Yeah, it's in a lot of products, like body products. Um, yeah, a lot of like lip balms and stuff. You can make your own lip balm. That's true. We have a kit. We just haven't done it yet. We'll add that to the to the list of things we need to do in our spare time. I'm with you. The past couple of weeks have been have been uh, busy, busy. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Ed says he needs some dead bees. Why do you need dead bees, Ed? Are you going to make something out of them? Yeah. It's also good to eat. Verna eats, you eat the wax? What does it have good in it to eat? And Andy wants to know, do you sell beeswax? I haven't sold beeswax. And just and it never it never came up. <laughs> and I'll and I'll uh, I'll collect you some bees and get you some scent over. It seemed like every time they have like a massive clear out, then it starts raining. <laughs> Is that why? Maybe that's to help wash away the dead bees. You ever think of maybe, that? Maybe so. Because they're they're pretty attuned to the weather. Oh, co copper coat them with jewelry. Ed has all sorts of ideas. Beeswax is less sugary than gum. Probably doesn't so, taste as good as most gum. Can you use it as a gum base? I chew on it. Like with every now and then you have some burr comb, just some wild comb that they decide to build off of the side of the frame. I'll scrape it off and they have a little honey in there and I'll just pop it in my mouth and chew it and get the honey out of it. Okay. And Joyce says, I use beeswax to condition my nylon thread when I'm beading. That makes sense. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. Um, honeycomb is good, but beeswax is better than the wax they used for bottle caps. Verna says, I don't know what that means. It's a little, it's like a candy drink bottle caps, oh, I believe she's talking okay. about. Okay. It's like, it's wax. It's shaped like a, a miniature bottle and they have a little liquid inside. You bite it off and you drink a little liquid out. I know because Lane has it, gets it every now and then. I don't know this. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Cool. Cool. Yeah, I haven't used um, the wax for anything, but I also haven't had bees. But I did buy one time the honey with the honeycomb in it. Mm -hmm. And having not, this is a long time ago, but having not understood like how everything works at that point, I was like, how do you get the honey out? <laughs> and that's not the point of buying the honeycomb with the honey is getting the honey out. Yeah. yeah. I had one person that wanted a jar of honey from me and they wanted some honeycomb in it. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to explain to them the extra work I go through to not have any honeycomb in the honey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was yeah. popular when you were a kid, Verna? Ed says, haven't had that in forever. <laughs> Jeez, Andy. <laughs> I, re I remember those when I was a kid, too. But me and Ed's the same age. Verna says, chewing honeycomb was a treatment for ear aches. Was it the honeycomb or was it the act of chewing, I wonder? Because I know sometimes ear stuff is connected with jaw. It was probably the chewing. That's my guess. Interesting. Interesting. Well, is there anything else you want to share with us? Thank you for the uh, the talk. Thanks for having me. I was so excited. <laughs> I couldn't I couldn't wait for the start. I was I was sitting down on the computer an hour before it started. Just waiting. And I was like, oh, I need to send him the link. <laughs> Oops. Oh, honey treats the infection while chewing helped with the draining. Okay. It's from Verna. Okay. 
Well, I hope we exceeded your expectations, Erin, and that everybody now knows how to grow bees, because I think we asked all the questions. <laughs> I hope I hope it helps someone. Yeah. Um, if anything, it helps us understand more about bees and the potential for, for keeping bees, and also for those people who can't have bees, what to do to maybe attract the bees and help out bees in general and that is to plant flowers yeah yeah absolutely yeah yeah so that's um i'm glad that you were able to impart some knowledge with us and yeah everybody check out his website um aaron and christina run gidro's family farm and they have you have quail eggs for sale. You have what are some of the stuff on your website? Um, I have just eggs on there. I think we're out of stock on silkies. Maybe turkeys we're out of stock on. Um, just I have quail eggs. I think quail <laughs> eggs and Jersey like Jersey Giants. I think I'm out of stock on some quail colors right now. I'm working actually put eggs in as soon as I get off of here to try to build up some more to keep up. I have, I have ones that just hatched today. So my, they're, they're actually being very, they've been very quiet all day, <laughs> but they're there. <laughs> yeah. And then, um, is Christina still, ha does she have the, uh, the little loofah soap things on there still or no? No. Sold out. Yeah. And earrings. Um, so the earrings we we just on most orders we send earrings with the egg orders. That's a cool freebie. It, I don't have my ears first, but yeah, it's it's, cool it's more of just a it's more of just a treat. We send that, and we send like the the quill claw necklaces and stuff, just as a you know a special little thank you. Because right. every you know we're, we're super small, so every order counts. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, um, who else could stay there and get their egg order filled and packaged by an eight-year-old? Child labor? Wait a minute. <laughs> he gets he, paid he gets very paid well. Up. Yeah. He gets paid <laughs> before I get paid, so. <laughs> oh, boy. He's going to have enough money to have his own farm when he's 10. <laughs> well, if it's up to Dale, he'll put me out of business before then. Yep. Yep. Um, Serena, did all your questions be answered? I believe so. I believe so. And captions will be on afterwards. But it's unfortunate they don't, we're not able to put them on as it's going, but we're not there yet technologically, right? Yeah. And good, good luck captioning my Southern accent. <laughs> You're not, it's not thick. It's not thick like some people's. Yeah. You know, when, Christina and I talk to people, they always ask, like, where are you from? Because Christina has a heavy Cajun accent. And mm -hmm. I was like, we grew up just a few miles from each other. Border makes a difference. Yeah. She, right. she was from a town further south. Just south enough, huh? Yeah. But she she's, she's older than me. She's well into her 40s. Oh, Aaron, we're not exposing information. <laughs> All right, Steve says there's more loofah in the greenhouse. Just saying, Steve, you got me there. And everybody's saying thank you. Buster says thanks for being here and sharing bee information. Joy says a great chat tonight. Can't afford to have a hive, but I'm sure I can plant flowers. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Aaron, for providing bee wisdom and stuff from Steve. Good night, Verna. Everybody saying saying thank you. And I say thank you because you are a wealth of knowledge. And I'm glad that we could take a couple hours and, and talk about bees. Uh, I didn't know what to expect if we were going to be talking, you know, part of the time about quail and other stuff. But, man, we talked about bees the whole time. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And we, we probably could have went on another hour. We can if you want. <laughs> I still have to collect eggs and feed. Oh, excuses, excuses. Yeah. Didn't do that before, huh? But but 10 p.m. here. Yeah, 
Yeah, it's it's Monday. Monday's feed day, so we had to offload feed. Oh. And then we had the goat incident of this week. I think we talked about that off camera. I don't know if you want to tell people what's going on or not. Yeah. So I have goats, and okay. um, yeah, they escape their enclosure. They ate Christina's rose bushes, her mimosa trees, um, basically everything they could. I mean, we were hauling feed, so the gate to the animal yard was open. They were running loose in the neighborhood. So I, I lassoed one, tied it up, and I couldn't catch the male. So I was like, I just carried the female. So the male followed him. I got them back in their cage. Uh, after I hauled it you know, several hundred feet, then I was tired, took a break. I saw how the female was getting out. She was squeezing through the bars. So I fixed all of them. He says, you got what? <laughs> yeah, actual goats, Steve. Actual goats. They need bigger fences is what I hear, Steve. Yeah. I, I was going to, you know, I kept it quiet. I was going to do a video on it this week, but. He yeah. covers one. I wanted to eat goat tonight. I'm, I was so I was so tired from carrying carrying the goat because they're adults and the female's pregnant. So oh. yeah, so, so she was happy. You got them before they made the evening news down the street, huh? Yeah, my neighbors were out helping me try to wrangle them. We have goats in our area that do fire control, fire suppression. Mm -hmm. And and weed control actually because they do train goats to eat particular nasty plants that they don't want spread, and they're in an area out like just outside on the hills of San Jose, and they broke through. They have those electric um, fences, mm -hmm. and there must it must have been off or they broke through something. And a and on the news this is a couple of years ago. On the news there was news of a bunch of goats, and they had. A, video of it coming down the road in his neighborhood and they were eating all everything <laughs> it's like oh you're gonna pay for a lot of plants dude <laughs> yeah yeah so there you go oh we're congratulating you on getting goats and andy says oh thank you I don't, I don't know if christina's happy about me having goats right now after her rose bush and her mimosa tree Oh boy! And and the neighborhood trip. She's in the background, just giving me all the the bad things since I got the goats. So I will say, my mom had an African violet in a pot inside, and it never really did anything. It was given to her by a, a student. She was a kindergarten teacher, and it never really did anything. There was a mouse in the house. It ate it all the way down. Well, they thought it was dead because it ate it all the way down and so my dad put it on, on the workshop bench in the garage he was going to take care of it later and it sat there well it sat there and it had a rebirth so now it's a huge plant and grows really really well so maybe maybe this is the pruning that mimosa tree needed i hope so i hope so if not i'll be planting a mimosa tree yep yep all righty. Well, thank you for imparting your wisdom and uh, thank you everybody for coming. I hope you learned what you wanted to learn. And if not, you didn't ask a question. So yeah. no fault. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Been awesome. 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 Yeah. All right. Um, thank you again. I know I learned stuff cause I knew about bees, but I didn't know a whole lot. And, uh, if I come upon that article, it's probably, there's probably newer articles about the fungus now. Um, I know I did a quick Google search when I was thinking about it and there's other, other types of fungus, but if I come upon that, I will, um, I will send it along and yeah, anything be related. I mean, you guys find stuff um, that's helpful or stuff that we talked about tonight, put it in the Facebook group and uh We'll continue continue the conversation there. Yeah. No. If you need anything, reach out. I'm always happy to answer questions. All right. 
Thank you. Oh, we're going to sign off now. Everybody have a wonderful night and a wonderful dinner. <laughs> Bye. Bye.